medical student from the Churchville College of Osteopathic Medicine in Missouri. And he will be talking about uh, minocycline induced intracranial hypertension. Okay, thank you for this opportunity, and uh, I think in the interest of time, we do have a, a third presentation, correct? Then uh, we'll just uh, cruise through this pretty quickly. Um, the case is a patient who presents with a bilateral transient visual obscurations in her vision and occasional dim outs. Uh, the history of her presentation is a 23-year-old female. In August, she complained of a plugged sensation in her right ear and a pulpital a tinnitus or a whooshing um, in the left ear greater than the right ear. About a week later, she went to her ENT who uh, treated her for an internal ear infection and gave her mucinex to try to decrease the congestive sensation, which offered no release and about that, or relief of her symptoms. About that same time, she began to notice um, gray spots in her vision. Um, the ENT ordered a, an MRI of, of the brain without contrast, which came back um, unremarkable and uh, recommended that she go to see an ophthalmologist. Uh, the ophthalmology exam showed bilateral disc edema and a decrease in visual acuity from her baseline, and uh, she was then referred here to the Moran Eye Center Neuro-Ophthalmology Department. Throughout this course of her history, she did have uh, mild, I'm sorry, moderate to severe headaches, um, which were, um, and, uh, and postural dim outs of her vision. Uh, as far as her pertinent medical history, it was pretty empty except that she was being treated for acne vulgaris um, with minocycline. Uh, family history, social history, and the review of uh, symptoms was uh, unremarkable. Her exam initially was also unremarkable. I'm unsure. Um, about three months. that does bring up a good question we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, she was able to um, read the 2020 line on, uh, on exam, although it, it did seem to be kind of eccentric and definitely slower than what she was used to. Pupils showed no apparent pupillary defect, um, no parent, apparent problem on confrontational visual field. Um, her uh, interocular pressures were normal and she had full um, color vision and full extraocular movement. Here's a copy of 24-2 uh, Humphrey visual field that was obtained in the clinic. And you can see on this exam um, enlarged um, blind spots in both eyes and maybe even a secocentral um, visual defect here. The foveal threshold and enlarged bi b um, blind spots were bilateral and a mean deviation of a minus seven in the right eye and a minus four in the left eye. Uh, sli on slit lamp exam and neurological exam, uh, those ten were unremarkable with no uh, focalizing defect or apparent uh, problem on the anterior slit lamp exam. Although fundus exam, um, as illustrated here, revealed uh, pretty, pretty strong four to five, uh, stage four to five uh, papilledema bilaterally with loss of the physiologic cup, um, parapapillary halos, uh, obscuration of the vesicles both as they leave the cup and even um, centrally as well with splinter hemorrhages. Um, so we begin thinking of a, how to build a differential of causes for, uh, peripap um, for papillary edema and uh, probably the best way to think through this is the Monroe, Monroe Kelly postulate which is based on three premi premises. First that the cranium is um, of a fixed volume and is uh, non-compliant and non-expansible. The pressure inside the cranium is a function of the volume of the contents. So the contents of the cranium being brain tissue, um, blood, and CSF. And an increase in the volume of any of the three components will um, either ne necessitate an increase in the pressure of the cranium or a uh, lessening of the volume of a, of a constituent component. So thinking through um, a possible differential list 
you need to consider um, changes in brain tissue volume, which may include uh, cerebral edema or uh, mass effects, changes in blood volume, which may include things like uh, hemorrhages, um, changes in CSF, either by increased production, like an inflammatory process, or, um, or the, uh, the reduction in outflow of CSF by uh, a process which blocks the outflow. So you can uh, create a differential along those lines, and examples of these could include uh, things like venous sinus thrombosis, intracranial mass, hydrocephalus, um, as, uh, as well as others. On workup, we are going to look to see if indeed she does have um, increased intracranial pressure associated with her papilledema. So we want to do a lumbar puncture. The opening pressure of this patient was 50 centimeters of water, um, and uh, the CSF analysis otherwise was normal with no uh, left shift or increased proteins um, and negative cultures. And then we wanted to review the MRI to look for um, signs of increased intracranial pressure. On this axial section uh, of a T2 weighted image, you can see here that she does have posterior flattening of the globes in the sclera. You can probably also appreciate some of the papilledema here into the globe. Um, although she doesn't have any of the other signs that we may see on MRI, which includes um, increased signal intensity um, of the optic disc, op optic nerve sheathing. Although it, it kind of looks like on this picture, it, it, it's um, kind of equivocal, as well as a flattening of the pituitary gland or an empty cella on a sagittal view. Um, but I think that the negative um, findings are perhaps just as important, especially when considering um, a diagnosis of uh, increased intracranial pressure. For example, no mass is found, there are no filling defects found in the uh, dural sinuses, no hemorrhage was seen, no edema, no choroid plexus adenoma, for example. And so these uh, negative findings need to work into our differential as well. Using the modified Dandy criteria, um, we are able to uh, um, see that this patient does have signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, such as visual obscurations, dim outs, papilledema on exam, she does complain of a pulse tinnitus and headache, as well as no other focalizing neurological symptoms. Elevated intracranial pressure on CSF analysis was apparent, um, and there was no ideology seen on imaging for that uh, increased intracranial pressure. So let's talk a little bit about tetracyclines and their um, relationship to intracranial hypertension. The first mention um, that I was able to find was an editorial comment by a physician Gellif in the yearbook of pediatrics where he was first to kind of put the label as a bulging fontanelle syndrome on infants who are being treated with tetracyclines. Um, this was done in 1956. It took a full 11 years for the first description of a tetracycline induced um, intracranial hypertension to appear by um, Dr. Koch Wieser and Gilmore in the, the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, but during the intervening period, there, has, there were um, many descriptions of the bulging Fontanelle syndrome, and since this time in 1967, there have been um, quite a few case studies regarding the connection between tetracycline and intracranial hypertension. Aminocycline is a semi-synthetic um, derivative of tetracycline. The advantage for treating acne vulgaris is that um, it requires only daily or bi-daily dosing rather than the four times a day of tetracycline or the first generation tetracyclines, um, and that the dosing um, strength is generally lower due to the increased half-life and the ability, um, uh, the increased activity in the serum. One thing that is important to understand is that it is three to five times more lipophilic than tetracycline or the first generation tetracyclines, which means that it penetrates into the CSF through the blood brain barrier more readily and um, can sit there and, and cause effects. Um, the link to intracranial hypertension was first described for minocycline specifically by Monocle in 1978. And uh, one of the interesting things through the research is that um, minocycline may cause intracranial hypertension in the atypical patient, uh, meaning non-obese females in males or um, in uh, adults or children. And so a few key questions will come up in relationship to uh, minocycline and, uh, and intracranial hypertension. 
First of which is what is the actual incidence of minocycline causing increased intracranial hypertension? Um, and that, that question can't really be answered very well. And the reason that can't be answered very well is that there hasn't been any um, cross-sectional studies to show what the actual incidence is. Um, minocycline is pretty um, frequently and commonly used by dermatology to, to treat acne as a first-line therapy. And as a result, you would expect that if there was a, a very strong correlation or a direct um, action of minocycline raising um, intracranial um, pressures, that the incidence of minocycline caused um, hyper intracranial hypertension would be quite high, just based on the, the prevalence of the use of minocycline, um, as that was postulated by Chu in 1998. Um, but in addition, uh, doctors Maroon and Mealy in 1971 suggested that uh, there are cases of not only um, asymptomatic intracranial hypertension and incidental findings of papilledema on exam associated with, uh, with minocycline use, that the um, actual incidence may be underreported or the um, prevalence of increased um, hypertension may be uh, underappreciated. Uh, who is the population at risk? Um, generally, the incidence across the um, broad population of people is uh, about 0 0.9 per 100,000. Um, that does increase quite a bit if you restrict the population to um, obese females of childbearing age. And that incidence will increase anywhere from 13 to 19 out of um, 100,000 uh, in the literature that I have seen. Um, the, like, the, the problem with the incidence associated with minocycline and assessing a population at risk, again, falls on the same problems of is it, uh, are there unreported cases because of asymptomatic papilledema or asymptomatic intracranial hypertension associated with minocycline use. Um, but it does seem that, uh, that the power of minocycline to induce this is not simply associated with the common risk factors of the general population uh, of gender, of weight, um, and of age because as uh, more Monroe and Brain and Walker have stated that uh, you can have minocycline induced intracranial hypertension associated with males, with children, um, and as well as non-obese females. Uh, what is the prognosis? Prognosis for minocycline induced intracranial hypertension is generally good, but that comes with a caveat. And one of the caveats is, is that some of these um, case studies have reported uh, an apparent division in the population of those who are affected by minocycline, and that is that some of them will have an indolent course. Um, often the majority of cases in the case studies will have a slowly progressive course, uh, onset of headaches that gradually worsen, visual obscurations which gradually um, worsen, and uh, those respond very well and quickly to cessation of minocycline as well as treatment with Dimot. Um, but there is a smaller subset of patients for which um, the, uh, the course of the disease may be much more fulminant, that uh, there's a more acute presentation of headaches, a more acute um, vision loss and, sim and symptoms associated with intracranial hypertension, which doesn't respond as quickly or as well to therapy. In fact, um, Gardner has uh, given the possibility that the, there may be a genetic predisposition in the population to a response from uh, an adverse response to minocycline therapy, um, which, uh, which creates a debate about whether or not minocycline is directly involved or if it's affecting a different population in a different manner. Um, perhaps that minocycline may be something that pushes a patient across a threshold into intracranial hypertension, um, which brings up the question of what is the mechanism by which minocycline may cause intracranial hypertension, and that has been unknown, although there have been reports um, by Stewart that uh, minocycline has an indirect effect on cyclic um, adenosine monophosphate within the arachnoid granulations and villi, or the subarachnoid um, villi where CSF is drained back into the dural sinuses, and by decreasing the activity of um, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, you are decreasing the reabsorption of CSF back into the systemic circulation, um, causing congestion. But that has not been um, elucidated in the literature. Going back to our case, 
Um, the final diagnosis then is the intracranial hypertension secondary to minocycline use. The plan and the general treatment guidelines includes an immediate discontinuing um, of minocycline therapy. Um, Diamox sequels uh, has become the standard of care, although it hasn't been established by any prospective research. Um, the known effects of di Diamox on reducing intracranial pressure kind of sets, its, uh, sets itself up for becoming the first line therapy, although the dosing uh, that we have given her can vary quite a bit on a per patient basis um, as you consider the clinical experience of the clinician as well as the uh, clinical signs and symptoms um, of the patient, as well as ma weight management and patient education um, regarding intracranial hypertension. On one month follow-up, the patient reported improved vision. She denied any headaches and pulsatile tinnitus. Her vision was stable and improving. Um, papilledema was reduced at one month um, to a stage three, and visual fields improved um, with a decreased physiologic blind spots and mean deviations also decreased. She was continued on Diamox at her current dosing with a plan to return in one month and reevaluate at that time. Um, now, a lot of the research uh, has been, well, actually all of the research that I have read on minocycline um, induced intracranial hypertension have, uh, has been exclusively case studies or, or case series presentations. And as such, there hasn't been uh, a formalized even retrospective study or, um, or prospective study of minocycline's connection. Uh, although there have been reports of varying degrees of the duration of minocycline use um, leading into intracranial hypertension. Um, anything from three days from the onset of therapy to weeks or even years later um, that may, where may minocycline may cause this intracranial hypertension syndrome. And the cessation of minocycline kind of follows the same course in regard to the resolution of the symptoms. There were some um, cases where, especially in the, sorry, especially in the older literature in the 70s where cessation of minocycline or, or tetracycline generally um, caused almost an immediate improval of symptoms within the same day to some of the symptoms being um, recalcitrant to uh, therapy even months and years later. Uh, the most common um, persistent effects would be things such as uh, reduced visual acuity and visual field defects. And that's it. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, she wasn't incredibly tall and she was um, obese, and that was definitely a confounding variable in this case and something to consider, which is why we included in the plan um, uh, weight, weight loss and education in that regard. I don't think that you can definitiv de definitively parse out the two in this case, um, although the reports in the literature that minocycline has induced this syndrome in non-obese females as well. Um, she didn't have a significant weight gain history either. Um, she didn't report uh, sudden weight increases or um, fluctuations in her, weight, in her weight in the years prior to presenting to us. So um, that may reduce a little bit of suspicion, but we can't definitively say that uh, that did not play a role. Um, there are reports in the literature of using Topamax um, based on the idea that it does lower intracranial hypertension, um, but uh, the biggest problem with that is that there's no prospective study um, comparing Topamax to Dimox or even alternatives like uh, loop diuretics, for example, um, all of which have been used in treatment. Um, so 
I, th I do think that there is a spectrum of therapy options available to the clinician, um, which also includes eventual uh, surgical intervention to help resolve the symptomatology um, after maximal medical therapy has failed. Uh, but unfortunately, um, the only I have I have read that Topamax has been used and has been used successfully in the literature, but uh, there's a pretty bad dearth of support for it besides case studies. Dr. Warner. Thank you. All right, so that was the last talk. Uh, Adam is going to go on another day uh, since we're out of time. Dr. Petty is left with the residents still behind.